This is the ninth video in a series covering complex analysis. And in the previous video, we looked at a nice test for when a function is analytic. So let's recall that really quick. So say we've got a complex function that can be broken into its real and imaginary part. So we can write it as u plus i v. And u and v are kind of functions of z, a complex number, but they're also kind of functions of x and y in R2. And that's because we can always identify the complex plane with the plane R2. Okay, so anyway, this function is analytic if and only if the partial of u with respect to x is equal to the partial of v with respect to y, and the partial of u with respect to y is equal to minus the partial of v with respect to x. So here, just to shorten everything up, I'm using this subscript notation to mean the partial derivative. Next, we've got this nice definition which is motivated from multivariable calculus, and we'll actually see that a few things that we do today will be motivated from multivariable calculus, and that is the Jacobian matrix for a complex function. So again, if we've got f is u plus i v, the Jacobian matrix, which we'll call j sub f, is this matrix whose first row is the partial derivatives of u, so we've got with respect to x here, with respect to y here, and the second row is the partial derivatives with respect to v. So we, we've got with respect to x here and with respect to y here. Then we've got another definition which we'll look at in just a bit. We don't quite need it yet. So first off, we're going to prove the following lemma which says if f is analytic, then the determinant of the Jacobian matrix is equal to f prime of z modulus squared, or the modulus of the derivative of f squared. Okay, so let's see how this goes. So this is going to be a straightforward calculation. The determinant of jf will be equal to the determinant of its defining matrix. So here we've got ux, uy, vx, vy right here, where I've used these big lines to say we're taking the determinant of that matrix. But now we're going to make some substitutions using the fact over here that we have an analytic function and we can replace vy with ux and maybe uy with minus vx. So let's see what that gives us. That'll be the determinant of ux, and then I've got a ux down here, because again, I can make that replacement because of this um, one of the Cauchy-Riemann equations. By the way, if you recall from the last video, these are called the Cauchy-Riemann equations. And then here we have, this is minus vx and then vx. So let's just notice that we made this substitution from here to here using one of the Cauchy-Riemann equations, and we made this substitution here to here using the other Cauchy-Riemann equation. That puts everything into a derivative with respect to x, which will be nice. So now taking that determinant, you'll see that we have ux squared plus vx squared. Now generally a sum of squares is not factorable, but since we're working over complex numbers, it is, and it factors nicely as ux plus ivx and then ux minus i vx. But now let's notice that that is equal to f prime of z. Just recall that there are a bunch of ways to find f prime when you write it in terms of its real and imaginary parts, and this was one of the ways. We used that in the previous video. And then this guy over here, well, it's the conjugate of this, which means it is the conjugate of f prime. So we have f prime times f prime of z conjugate, but that gives us exactly the modulus of f prime squared by, again, some stuff we did very early on. So now that we've done this lemma, we're going to prove a really important theorem having to do with the derivative of an inverse function. And again, we're going to use some stuff from multivariable calculus to make it a quick proof. So we've got a pretty big statement for this theorem, but it provides us a nice result which we're familiar with from calculus. And like I said, we're going to make heavy use of the version of this theorem in multivariable calculus to make the proof fairly reasonable. Okay, so let's see what we've got. 
we want to suppose that f is an analytic function on a domain d, and then z0 is in d, where f prime evaluated at z0 is not equal to 0. So that's our hypothesis. And then our conclusion is this big sentence. So then there is an epsilon bigger than zero such that the epsilon neighborhood about Z naught is completely contained in D. We'll call that epsilon neighborhood U. And that epsilon neighborhood satisfies the following conditions. F is one to one on U. F of U is open, so that's the image of U. And then f inverse is a function from f of u back to u. So if f is one to one and onto, well, it's going to be one to one on u, but then it'll definitely be onto f of u, then that means it has an inverse function. Just by bijectivity implies there is an inverse. So that inverse function happens to be analytic. And furthermore, if we take that inverse function's derivative and evaluate it at f of z, we get 1 over f prime of z. And that's going to be true for all z within u. So there's a lot going on here, but the proof is not so bad. So what we'll do is make a view of f going from r2 to r2 instead of from C to C. So if we generally think about F of Z as U plus IV, then we kind of make that view FXY to be the vector field UV, where those both depend on X and Y. So the multivariable version of this theorem says that we have an inverse mapping. And so let's maybe say that inverse mapping, F inverse, uh, looks like this. Let's say if we evaluate that at x, y, we get a comma b. So those are both functions of x and y. So here we've got F inverse evaluated at F is going to be the identity on R2. And then F evaluated at F inverse will also be the identity evaluated on R2. And again, the multivariable version of this theorem has made our epsilon neighborhood around our point Z0. Okay, so anyway, now, again, from uh, our multivariable version, we know the Jacobian of F inverse is equal to the Jacobian of F inverse. So that's a really important statement there. And so just again, all of this comes from maybe multivariable calculus. But that's going to be the last thing that we use within multivariable calculus. Now we're going to jump back to complex numbers. So writing this in terms of complex numbers, that means that if we take the inverse, uh, the Jacobian of F inverse, and we evaluate it at F of Z, that should be the same thing as the Jacobian of F inverse evaluated at Z. Okay, so that's just a rewriting of this multivariable calculus rule in this complex analysis rule. So this is starting to look good, but now we can write the Jacobian matrix for F inverse pretty easily. That'll be AX, AY, and then BX, BY. And then the inverse of the Jacobian matrix, that's also pretty easy to write down because we know something about the inverse of a two by two matrix. So in particular, it'll be one over the determinant, but notice the determinant is the modulus of F prime squared by our lemma that we had on the last board. And then we need the following matrix, which will be VY and UX on the diagonals. So the diagonals have been switched. Again, we're using the standard rule for finding the inverse of a two by two, and this will be minus UY minus VX right here. So let's maybe bring this up to this point right here, and then we can finish this proof off. So on the last board, we had our function F, which was U plus IV, and F inverse was A plus I. B. Also found the Jacobian of each one, and through an argument involving multivariable calculus, we have this is the uh, Jacobian of F inverse, and this over here was also the Jacobian of F inverse, just using the fact that F was the inverse of F inverse. So now we want to check the Cauchy-Riemann equations for F inverse, which will prove that F inverse is analytic. Then after we do that, we can find the derivative. So the Cauchy-Riemann equations for F inverse look something like this. 
this. We want a sub x to be equal to b sub y. So I'll put a question mark over it, but notice that a sub x is equal to v sub y over f prime of z squared. And then b sub y is equal to u sub x over f prime of z squared. Or I guess I should say modulus f prime z squared. But since ux is equal to vy, we're good to go there. So maybe if we were to extend this out, we would do it as follows. So notice that a sub x will be vy over modulus f prime squared, but that's equal to ux over modulus f prime squared, but that's equal to b sub y. Again, that's just taking the appropriate entry out of this, this matrix. So that means our first of the Cauchy-Riemann equations is satisfied. And all of that is hinging off the fact that the Cauchy-Riemann equations are satisfied for our kind of original function f. Okay, nice. Now I'll let you guys check the other Cauchy-Riemann equation. That's actually pretty easy to do. Now we'll calculate f inverse prime. Well, f inverse prime evaluated at f of z. So let's notice that'll be ax plus ibx from some stuff that we saw earlier. So we've got ax plus ibx. But now we can use this matrix to pull out versions of that in terms of our u and v. So that's going to be v sub y minus i v sub x all over f prime squared. Again, just uh, pulling out the appropriate entries here. But now we can apply Cauchy-Riemann equations to this and rewrite this as um, u sub x, because we know u sub x is equal to v sub y. But now notice that numerator is the conjugate of f prime. So we have the conjugate of f prime over modulus f prime squared, which gives us exactly one over f prime of z, which is exactly what we wanted. Okay, so that finishes this proof. Now let's do a couple of examples. So for our first example, we'll say that f of z is any branch of the natural logarithm. So let's recall what that means. That means that f of z is equal to the principal branch, so we generally call that logz, plus two pi times i times n, for some integer n. So if n is equal to zero, we have the principal branch. If n is not equal to zero, we have one of the other branches. Okay, so let's also recall that we can take log z. So the principal branch is equal to the natural log of the modulus of z. So that's like the natural log of a real number. We know how to do that plus i times the principal part of the argument of z, where we take that argument to be between negative pi and pi. And here we don't include pi because that's where the branch cut is occurring. So sometimes we write that as this log z is defined for all complex numbers minus the negative real axis. So we would write that as minus infinity to zero, not including zero either. So now our goal is to find the derivative of f. <clears throat> In other words, the derivative of any branch of this logarithm. Okay, and we can do that using the function inverse function relationship of the exponential and the logarithm. So let's now note that e to the f of z is equal to z. That's because all of these f of z's will be inverse functions of the exponential. So now we can take the derivative of both sides, and that'll give us something like this. We'll have f prime of z times e to the f of z equals 1. But now that's going to be the same thing as f prime of z times z equals 1, or 
f prime of z is equal to one over z. But that's maybe what we would expect because we know the derivative of, of natural log is one over z. So maybe we could write that as the derivative with respect to z of logz is equal to one over z. And that's for the principal branch, but notice it's also true for all of the other branches. Now, I'd like to say in order to get off the ground in the first place, we would need to make an argument that our inverse function is indeed analytic in the first place, but it most definitely is because it's the inverse of the exponential. And with this branch cutting, we have it in a region where it's one to one for sure. Okay, so let's maybe clean this up and we'll do another one. So our next goal is to find the derivative of the inverse sine function. And the inverse sine function will also have infinitely many branches as we'll see as we work through this. And in fact, we want to use the fact that we know the derivative of the logarithm to help us find the derivative of this. And that'll like clue us into what the branches should be as well. So let's maybe start by setting w equal to the inverse of the sine function, but you know, that's equivalent to saying that sine of w is equal to z. But now we'll rewrite sine of w using its exponential form. That means we can write z as, let's see, it'll be e to the i w minus e to the minus i w over 2i. So if you recall, that's how we define trigonometric functions in the complex plane. We define them via their like exponential counterparts. Okay, nice. Now we're gonna move some things around so that we can solve for w. So first we'll see that we have two times i times z is equal to e to the i w minus e to the minus i w. Then moving the two i z over, we'll see that we have e to the i w minus two i z minus e to the minus i w is equal to zero. Next, we'll multiply both sides by e to the i w. That doesn't change anything because that is never equal to zero. And that's gonna give us e to the i w quantity squared minus two times i times z times e to the i w, and then minus one equals zero. So now we've got a quadratic equation where we can view this e to the i w as our variable. So that means we'd probably like to use the quadratic formula to solve. And that gives us the following solution for e to the i w. So I'll let you guys plug into the quadratic formula, but it's pretty easy to see that you get i z and then plus the square root of one minus z squared. And you might say, well, where's the plus and minus? And so we don't need the plus and minus because we're viewing this square root of one minus z squared as a multi-valued function. So like I said, this is multi-valued. And the only reason to have that plus or minus in the real numbers is to get the two values out of it. Okay, so that's what we're left with here. Now we can take the log of both sides and we'll get the following. So we'll have i w is equal to, well, let's write this down. It'll be the principal branch of the logarithm of i z plus the square root of one minus z squared. And then plus, we'll have two pi i times n, or maybe two i times n pi. Again, those are gonna be all of the other branches of the logarithm. So in the end, solving for w, we see that sine inverse z is in fact equal to one over i times this principal branch of the logarithm, i z plus root one minus z squared, that's inside the logarithm, and then plus two n pi. Okay, so notice this is a multi-valued function like we said before. Okay, so let's now maybe bring that up and then we'll find its derivative using the fact that we know the derivative of the principal branch of the logarithm. Okay, so we ended the last board with the following like complex logarithmic version of the inverse sine function. Notice it's multi-valued because n can be from any integer.
Now, maybe if we take the part that's not multi-valued, in other words, the part including just the principal branch of the logarithm, maybe we could give this maybe the notation arc sine. And since we're like capitalizing when we need the, mean the principal branch, maybe we could capitalize the A and arc sine of Z there. So now let's take the derivative and here we can use the chain rule along with the fact that we have just derived the derivative of the logarithm. So we have d by dz of sine inverse z is equal to, let's see, we'll have this one over i out front and then we'll need this sent to the denominator. So that'll be iz plus root one minus z squared. And then the derivative of this in the numerator, that'll give us i and then minus z over the square root of one minus z squared. So that's using the chain rule and like just the derivative of the square root function and stuff like that. Then the derivative of the two n pi is zero. Okay, so this is looking good. Now next, maybe we'll take this one over i and multiply it in. So notice that will cancel this to a one and then we'll have minus one over i times this. But let's recall that one over i is the same thing as negative i. So we can change this to plus i times z like that. And now we can start simplifying. So maybe we'll do that by multiplying the numerator and the denominator by the square root of one minus z squared. And that's because in the denominator of the numerator, we have that term. So that causes us some simplification. So let's see. Now in the numerator, we will have the square root of one minus z squared and then plus i z. So that's going to cancel over i z plus the square root of one minus z squared. And then I'll leave this other one outside. So we have this one over square root one minus z squared outside. But now we have the same thing in the numerator and the denominator here. Those So those will cancel and we're left with one over the square root of one minus z squared. So notice that's going to be multi-valued because the square root function is multi-valued. So, but it's only two valued because the square root function is only two valued. So we took the derivative of an infinitely valued function. So sine z has infinitely many branches and we ended up with a function with two branches. So I think that's kind of interesting. Okay, so let's clean this up and then we're gonna start looking at harmonic functions. So now we're ready for our forgotten definition down here that we skipped earlier. So let's define the following operator. So I'll call it del, and it is the second derivative with respect to x1 plus the second derivative with respect to x2 plus the second derivative with respect to x3, ending at the second derivative with respect to xn. So this operates on functions of n variables. So this is a bit more general than what we'll work with, but it's useful to recall the definition. So just for instance, if g is a function from rn to r, so in other words, it's a function of n variables, then del g will be the second derivative of g with respect to x1, plus all the way up to the second derivative of g with respect to xn. Furthermore, we call this operator the Laplacian. Next, if del g is equal to zero, in other words, the Laplacian on g is equal to zero, then we say g is harmonic. So that's the definition of a harmonic function. Okay, so how does this tie in with what we're doing? Well, let's look at the following theorem. It says that if f is an analytic function that can be broken up into real and imaginary parts like we've been doing, where those two parts, u and v, have continuous second partials, then u and v are both harmonic functions. So let's maybe see how this might go. So we we'll wanna look at uxx plus uyy. So that's the second derivative with respect to x plus the second derivative with respect to y. We only have two variables here, though, so that's all we need to look at. I'm using this kind of shorter notation, but notice that is the same thing as the partial with respect to x of ux plus the partial with respect to y of uy. Looking good. Now we can apply the Cauchy-Riemann equations to each of these. So that'll be the partial with respect to x of vy. Here we applied, like I said, the Cauchy-Riemann equations to write ux as vy. 
And then this is going to be plus the partial derivative with respect to y of minus, let's see, vx. Again, that's from a part, uh, cauchy riemann equation up here. But in the end, we see that we get vxy minus vyx because we've got these partials that are mixed at this point. But since these have continuous second partials, we know that these two mixed partials are the same, so this simplifies out to zero. And then maybe I won't do this because it's pretty simple. It's just exactly like what we did. So just check that VXX plus VYY is equal to zero. But the zeroness of these two expressions means that each one is harmonic. So that's good. Now let's maybe introduce the notion of a harmonic conjugate and look at an example or two. So now let's look at a new definition as well as an example, and then that'll set us up to finish off with a theorem regarding these kind of things. Okay, so if u is harmonic, then the harmonic conjugate, I should really say maybe then a harmonic conjugate of u is the harmonic function v such that f, which is equal to u plus i, v is analytic. So you can think of it as like the missing piece of the puzzle to create an analytic function if you're given a harmonic function. Okay, so let's look at an example. So let's start with u, which is maybe equal to x plus x, y. So we can pretty easily check that this is harmonic, and that's because uxx plus uyy is equal to 0 plus 0, which is equal to 0. So the second derivative of this with respect to x is 0, second derivative of this with respect to x is 0, and likewise for y. Okay, nice. So now let's suppose that f is equal to u plus iv, but I'll write this as x plus xy plus iv. So let's just note that this is u in our setting. So the Cauchy-Riemann equations tell us a couple of things. They tell us that u sub x is equal to v sub y, and they also tell us that u sub y is equal to minus v sub x. So since we know what u is, that gives us this like system of partial differential equations that we can easily solve for v. So let's see, this tells us that v sub y is equal to the partial of this with respect to x. That's gonna be one plus y. And then this right here tells us that v sub x will be equal to negative the partial derivative of this with respect to y. So that's gonna be minus x. Now the game that I like to play is take the integral of this with respect to y. So if we do that, we'll get, let's see, this will be v is equal to y plus one half y squared plus, I'll say g evaluated at x. So that's a function just of x. Because if we take the derivative of that with respect to at y, it will become zero and we'll be left with this. So now let's take this and take its derivative with respect to x. So that's going to give us v sub x is equal to g prime of x. But that gives us a really simple differential equation for g prime. g prime of x is equal to negative x. So that tells us that g prime of x is equal to negative one half x squared. Okay, but that means we have a version of v. We have y plus one half y squared minus one half x squared. And I guess I should have a constant there as well. So that means I can replace this v with um, y plus one half y squared minus one half x squared. And then I can absorb the i into the constant and put plus c outside of the whole thing. Okay, so now we have a function f, which is guaranteed to be analytic just by our construction. But it's not super satisfying because it's in terms of x and y, and we'd like it in terms of the complex variable z. So let's finish this example by showing that 
it can be written in terms of the complex variable z. And we'll do that by starting to notice that this x and then this i y, where this i is being distributed through, is exactly z. So we can start by writing this as x plus i y. Since those are underlined in yellow, maybe I'll put them in a yellow parentheses. Okay, so that's pretty good. And then where do we want to go from there? Well, this is a little bit tricky, but we're actually going to factor out a minus i from the rest of the stuff. And then put all of everything else together. So we'll have this right here, and then this right here, and this right here. So if we factor out a minus sign, then the signs of this will change. So that'll give us something like 1 half x squared, and then a minus 1 half y squared there. Then if we factor a minus i out of that, that's the same thing as like multiplying by i because 1 over negative i is positive i, so that'll be plus i times x, y. And then we've got this plus a constant on the outside. Now, that's not quite ready for rewriting as z, but maybe if we factor out a half, it will be ready. So that means we can write this as z. That's already good to go. Then minus i over 2, and now we're left with x squared, and then plus 2 times i times xy, and then plus, I'm going to write this as i times y quantity squared. Obviously, it's minus y squared but we can use the fact that i squared is negative 1, and that really um, slams home the fact that that is like z squared, or a perfect square binomial at this point. Okay, so now like I said, this is exactly x plus i y squared, if you just look at how it looks. So here we have this is z minus i over 2 times z squared plus a constant. Okay, so that's our function f in terms of the complex variable z. So now let's get rid of this and we're going to prove a uniqueness condition on harmonic conjugate. So this is the final result of the video before we end with some warm-up exercises. And it says that harmonic conjugates are unique up to a constant. So let's maybe suppose that u is harmonic and we have harmonic conjugates v1 and v2. So let's say v1 and v2 are its harmonic. Now they may not be all of the harmonic conjugates, but they are at least two of the harmonic conjugates. Okay, so what does that tell us? That tells us that this function f1, which is u plus i v1, and this function f2, which is u plus i v2, are both analytic. Remember, that's essentially the definition of a harmonic conjugate. It's like the piece that's missing to form an analytic function. Okay, now we can take a linear combination of analytic functions. We'll have an analytic function. So let's take a careful linear combination. So now let's consider, we should say, maybe the analytic function, which is i times the quantity f1 minus f2, which is, like I said, analytic. Analytic. But now using our definition for f1 and f2, we can simplify this a little bit. And what we'll see is we get i times iv1 minus iv2, but that'll give us 2i squared, which switches the order of the subtraction. So let's rewrite that. We have i f1 minus f2 is now v2 minus v1. So again, that's just simple arithmetic based on the definition of f1 and f2. Okay, so now we've got an analytic function, but notice that this analytic function is always real valued. That's because v1 and v2 are both real valued functions. But if you recall in the previous video, we proved that every analytic function which only produces real values is a constant. So I'll just kind of recall that fact. I'll let you guys look at the previous video if you need to check up on that. So this implies that v2 minus v1 is equal to c, a constant. Okay, so that's cool, but that means that these differ by a constant, but that's the same thing as saying that these harmonic conjugates are unique up to a constant. That means the only way that they could differ is by a constant. Okay, so that finishes off the proof of this theorem.
Okay, so let's finish off with a couple of warm-up problems. So I'm gonna leave you guys with two warm-up problems. The first is to find the derivative of any branch of the inverse tangent function. So the really careful way to do this at this stage of the game is to rewrite the inverse tangent function in terms of a complex logarithm. And we can do that by writing the original tangent function in terms of complex exponentials, just like we did with our example in the video. So for our next um, warm-up problem, let's show that each of the following functions is harmonic, find its harmonic conjugate, and then write the resulting analytic function in terms of the complex variable z. So let's start with x squared minus y squared, and then the second one will be 3x squared y minus y cubed. And that's a good place to stop.